Yes. In case you just wandered in off the street and didn't realize uh, that uh, we're meeting here, this is the College of Complexes, and anybody who hasn't paid the $3 tuition should see me later. <laughs> All right. Uh, beyond that, I want everybody to know our first and most important rule, and what is that? One fool at a time. That's right. We want to hold a discussion here, and if we are all talking at once, ah, he found it here. There. The fair exchange. Thank you. Uh, if we're all talking at once, we don't quite understand what's going on. Or it's easy to get confused, and sometimes it's happier that way. <laughs> but we have a second rule, and that is that we do not insult anybody personally here, uh, or their mothers or fathers. Well, all right. Uh, their ideas are fair game, however. I'm sorry. The rule is no personal debt. Is there any reason we can't leave it at that? <laughs> it's been that way for 50 years. We'll okay, fine. You know, come on now. Your mother wears well, combat no clothes. No one else does. Charlie, you want to pair. Your mother wears combat clothes. Uh, beyond that, we have an agenda. And that starts off with announcements. And Charlie has lots of announcements. And after the announcements, uh, we hear from our speaker, uh, Mr. Charlie Earp, uh, and uh, he will be talking to us about uh, how Jesus made him a communist. We will go to hear our speaker, Charles Earp. Public, so you know, go easy on me. No. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure. Well, Charles Haydock emailed me after something I posted on an Illinois socialist discussion about when I had the subject titled Jesus Made Me a Communist, and so he said, Come and talk about that. Um, the, the title is uh, came out of a non fiction creative writing class I took over the summer, and I was trying to figure out how to tell part of my life story. So it's really, I mean, yes, there's politics, and yes, there's religion, but it really is my story. Um, and I, so the description, I don't know if it covered all, how much it covered, so I may repeat piece of bits of that. Um, I was raised a Pentecostal preacher's kid, uh, born in 1963. Uh, don't remember more, more, more of the 70s and the 60s, and remember things like you know the Vietnam protests, uh, the Jesus Movement. I don't know if anybody has heard of the Jesus Movement. Um, that was a pretty influential thing. My my father was pastoring a little church in a town of about 3,000 in Western Illinois, known as Bushnell. You may have heard of it. And um, there were college dropouts from Western Illinois, 30 miles away, descending on the town to set up these set up a little commune and. He thought, well, why don't I invite these Jesus people to come play Christian rock music to save these people? And that was a, I was probably six or seven years old, and it had a big influence on my perception of the religion I was growing up in. Um, the religion I was growing up in was apolitical to, con to conservative. My father actually was a Democrat most of his life, up until 1984, the second Reagan campaign. He decided to switch parties. But prior to that, he was a Democrat. Um, so I contend that this Christian right that everybody sees really came out of the 70s. It, didn't, it wasn't, that wasn't a factor in where I grew up. Um, but because of the Jesus people that I saw um, and the connections I was making with that, with the story I was hearing in the Bible about Jesus saying, love your neighbor, love your enemy, give all you have away, follow me, care for the poor, and then the way that in the story in Jerusalem, after the death of Jesus, the resurrection, they started sharing everything. And 
basically it was a commune. I mean, you, you practically could write, um, you know, to each according to need, from each according to ability, based on Acts chapter 4. Um, so, as I grew up and was influenced by this different view of Christianity that I later figured out I was one of the few people who thought about it this way, even in my own religion, I lived with a commune for nine years here in Evanston. Uh, you may have heard of Rima Place Fellowship. They've been living communally since 1957. I was also influenced by the Jesus people of Uptown who've been living together communally since some point in the early 70s. Um, now, I'm not here to convince anybody to become a Christian because I actually have drifted away orthodox-wise from all that. Um, in a couple of the years while I was living with the commune, I went to college. I'm a college dropout, a three-time college dropout. I'm proud of that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> at the age of 49, I finally made a commitment to myself to finish my degree. Um, so I am getting a degree in political science. Um, anyhow, <laughs> So, um, at the, I went to college in, say, 87, 88, 89, and encountered for the first time Marx and the anarchists and the feminists and started, my worldview kind of got pushed even further. And that was when I would say this whole, you know, I began to accept the word communist for who I was politically. Um, so, let's see. I, I mean, this is really about a, my story, but to give you some background on Sweetheart. communism and Christianity. The person who invented the word communist was a Christian. That's not often known. Uh, Etienne Cabet was a French utopian socialist, as Karl Marx would have called him. He actually was the founder of the Icarian commun communes that were, several of them were found in the United States in the 1900s. Um, so he invented the word communist and then the, the Marxists and the French radicals and the German radicals took that word and gave it their own meaning. Um, and so I, I maintain that the idea originated as a religious idea, even though, you know, um, it's viewed as hostile, anti-religion, and so on. Now, of course, we, we hear since, say, 1990 or so that communism is dead, Soviet Union's gone, thank God. Um, and why would I be saying that Jesus was a communist when everybody knows he's a Republican in the United States, right? <laughs> um, but again, as I say, the Christian right was not how I was raised. I, I didn't think, you know, that wasn't my understanding of what I've been taught. Um, let's see. I let's see. I have a lot of notes, but I'm going to skip most of those because um, I realize that we don't have a lot of time. Um, uh -huh. How much time do you take? As much as I need. All right. Thank you. Um, so, in after the about nine years living with the uh, Christian community and realizing that that you know, great, we had we had very radical sharing, but it wasn't changing the world. Capitalism was still going on. I began to, as I said, I did these two years at college, and I'm like, well, what's the politics here? You know, you can. We, this little commune and Dorothy Day's Catholic workers, but you add all that up, you still don't have a force. And of course, Marx said the force was the working class. You unite them, you get a communist party or a socialist party to unite them for their own interests and overthrow the capitalists. Well, we know that didn't come about. Um, so here we are, 2012. You know, there's maybe two communist governments on the planet, maybe three, depending if you count North Korea or not. Um, I don't. Um, anyway, what do we do? Um, so communism is, is dead, and why would anybody in 2012 be talking about this? And I would say because it's, it's still, the idea of from each according to ability to each according to need is still a vibrant idea that needs to be rethought in the 20, 20 uh, first century. And um, it's interesting that even atheist communist philosophers today who would not, you know, you wouldn't think, would turn to the New Testament. They're finding that in there, there's elements, um, particularly Alain Badiou is a French uh, communist philosopher, and uh, Slavoj Žižek, who is a Slovenian, you know, from the former Yugoslavia, is also advocating that we reclaim what he calls the atheist heart of Christianity, he says, because God dies, 
and is reborn in the Holy Spirit of the church who's following Jesus by sharing everything. Interesting take for an atheist, but um, he's, he has, he's written three books on that very kind of a theme, on Christianity and atheism and communism. And he kind of emboldened me when I started realizing that he was saying things that I'd already believed. Um, a little bit about where I am today. I, um, I have gone through all of the left-wing organizations, which have, not all of them, but many of them. You know, the, the, um, the International Socialist Organization, the uh, Democratic Socialists of America, the, um, the Committees of Correspondence. I was actually a member of two years for Committees of Correspondence for Socialism and Democracy, and for various reasons, just didn't keep that up. I, this year, in the summer, I joined the Socialist Party USA. I would like to see the local Chicago Socialist Party chapter come back to life. There's about 20 or so paper members, but we've only been able to pull up one meeting since I joined. So if you're, if anybody's interested in that, that's the only plug I think I have is, you know, the, we should see what the Socialist Party could do. Um, I am, I'm also, I've been involved for, since 1997 with a Quaker meeting, and I find that much more congenial to my sort of post-Orthodox uh, point of view, because Quakers tend to be uh, non-literal about the Bible, and I'm no longer really literal. I, you, can, you can make the argument Jesus didn't really exist, and I say, that's fine, but the story exists, and people believe the story, and if you can reinterpret the story, maybe the Christian right can be you know, put to rest. Maybe it'll become a thing of the past. I've been hoping that my entire adult life, and actually, even though I didn't vote for Barack Obama, I did vote socialist, the fact that the, the Christian right lost and that they were forced to vote for a Mormon, I think, was a great irony on the Christian right. <laughs> so um, I think their time in the sun, you know, since they're, you know, claiming that they voted in Reagan, Reagan two, Bush, Bush two and three, I hope believe their their time is over. Um, a new engagement with a different philosophy, and I think Occupy Wall Street was a great inspiration for the time that it lasted, and I know that there are organizations, well, there are, uh, there are, all the Occupy movements still have sort of these organizations or groups of people that still meet and still try to make something, you know, even though the movement is sort of past and is no longer the popular uh, thing that it was, but uh, it was a very, the whole targeting of the 1% was a clearly an economic radical politics, even if you also had a lot of libertarians in there trying to turn it to their own advantage. But at any rate, um, so I think there is still a discontent with capitalism in this country and, uh, and around the world. I mean, look at what's going on in you know, Tunisia and Egypt and um, Syria. And you know, there is a discontent with um, capitalism. And you know, it's, uh, I honestly hope that more people would like to see it replaced with something more humane, more generous, uh, I often, you know, to me, the, the I like to, you know, say that uh, we we think about politics as based on calculation and rationality, and those are important things, you know. And I, I don't discount them, despite my religious upbringing. But I also think that human beings are about love and sharing and caring and community, and those should be the center of our life, not calculation and advantage and privilege. So. My message, I think, is pretty simple, and, um, is that we can, if we pull together, unite uh, the working people of the world, just like Mark said, they have nothing to lose but their chains. Let's give it a new try in a new era. I think that covers what I have to say. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm the question. I'm the answer guy. I have all the answers. <laughs> Yeah, there, <laughs> Ron, okay. Back up because of that. Yes, all right. I'll try to get out of the line of uh, fire here. If you have any uh, objections to being uh, videotaped uh, with uh, Tim Bolger, I'll let you write out. Okay. Yes, Gene. Yeah, just Gene a Martin. point of information. Uh, uh, could you give the name? Clearly, again, of the guy who invented the term or started the term, the French, you said, are the, a French uh, right. Christian. What was his name? Etienne, which is E T I E double N E, Cabet, C A B E T. 
and you can find, um, I actually Googled it and found some of the stuff he's actually written. It's online and translated. He actually came to the United States, and the, the Icarian communes were actually more, bigger in the United States than they were in France, but the ideas were formed in France. Thank you. What year? Okay. Yes? 1820s? Maybe? I, I'm really weak on that. I, I should know that fact, but I didn't look it up before I came. All right. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember your name yet. Yes? Christians deal with this whole history of the early Christians who share all of their, like, what's their response to that? Do they even, are they aware of it? Do they, like, explain it away? Like, I would say explain it away. Um, that's simple. I mean, the way it was taught to me, because I remember my dad would actually preach through the whole book of Acts. And he would say, so they started this commune, but then in chapter 6 it was crushed. And it does say that, that all the Christians were driven out of Jerusalem except for the apostles. And he says... You know, and, and so there's sort of like this was just an early burst of enthusiasm, and it, there isn't any permanent, you know. If, now, the Catholic Church institutionalized it in the monastic tradition and said, you know, yeah, if you want to live that way, go live in a commune or in a monastery. So the Catholic Church sort of siphoned it off, whereas the Protestants tend to just, you know, well, that, that was only, that was for back then, not today. Okay. Yeah, that's right. The Icarians, didn't they move into Nauvoo after the Mormons left? Yes. And aren't they the ones who have that ceremony there every year that involves the wedding of the wine and the cheese? Very pop. I, I, I don't know as enough about the Icarians as I should, but you're right about Nauvoo. They did take over the Mormon, what was left of the Mormon Nauvoo settlement when they were driven out of Nauvoo. Yes, Bob Matter? Yeah, this phrase, uh, from each according to his ability, uh, do they mean at gunpoint? Or <laughs> I don't mean at gunpoint. I, I, I became more or less a Christian pacifist, which again, my church didn't teach any of this stuff, but the Jesus movement in the 60s sort of scrambled it for me. So I became a pacifist. I'm a Quaker. No, I don't mean at gunpoint. I mean, then again, <laughs> I tend to think capitalism takes from the working class at gunpoint, but... We call them the police, but they still do. Anyway. Yes. Uh, Margaret? Um, I, I didn't understand the name of the communities that were formed for Barian. Icarian, like Icarus, the, oh, I, the, the I myth see. of Icarus with the wax wings. A-R-I-A-N. Yeah, I-C-A-R-I-A-N, Icarian. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Tim Bolger and then Michael. <laughs> I, would like, I would like you to espouse a little bit more on your personal philosophy of God and how you found him, and was there a conversion experience of any kind in your own life at any point? Um, well, I was raised Pentecostal, uh, spoke in tongues by the age of nine, uh, which is a pretty significant part of our tradition. Mm -hmm. um, I, Before that point, I believed I got saved, but I, I asked to be baptized that same year. Um, and again, because of my Christian faith is why I moved to live with this coming. We were actually living in Texas when my daughter was born. My daughter is here, by the way, and uh, she was born in 85. We moved in 86 to live with the community. Um, my wife is also back there. She, we've been married 30 years. Um, we were both raised Pentecostal. We met at a college. Um, so yes, I had a very Orthodox Christian faith up through, say, 1996, and then kind of reevaluated that and there was there was a lot of personal stuff as well as intellectual stuff. Um, I would say now I'm a universalist. I don't I don't hold that any one religion has all the answers. So um, but definitely, you know, as I say, the Christian part was very formative for me. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah so Mike Foley. I got a question too about that philosophy of each according to his abilities and each according to his needs and all. Who's the guy that gets to decide how much a person's abilities are and how much he's got to kick in? <laughs> and who gets to decide how much a person's needs are and how much he gets to get? Right. Who's the big shot transferring all the money? Right. Well, I, 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 think, I think we can sort of rule out that anybody needs a Rolls Royce. You know, and we can rule out that anybody should starve to death. So we got a lot of ground in the middle. But who decides? 
Um, well, the community in Evanston, it was, it was a collective decision. We had individual groups, small groups of people. Decisions were kind of passed back and forth. Um, there are actually some decision-making proposals, uh, particularly one that I kind of like is Participatory Economics by Michael Albert, the uh, founder of Z Magazine and an associate of Noam Chomsky. And Participatory Economics argues for local communities or local councils and the people you know, propose consumption and propose workplace formats and that these are sort of elect democratically voted on. I actually, you know, the, to me, uh, socialism and not, uh, communism is one thing, but socialism is just the, should be, should be, and I admit that in history it has been, it's, it has been at least in the experience of the Stalinist period in Russia, has been the imposition of a bureaucratic decision on the working, on the masses, and I'm not for, you know, that imposition through force, but uh, if it's a democratic decision, because I mean, even in your own workplace, you can't vote to fire your boss. You know, just a little democracy, even in the workplace, is a radical idea. So I believe in democracy. I don't believe in top down. Um, I understand why some people in Russia thought it was necessary to push it from the top down, but I don't want to defend that because that's we know how that ended. It ended in 19, you know, what, 90, 89, 1990. Didn't end well. So. We can rethink it. I'm all about rethinking it, rethinking it democratically. Uh, Peter, so uh, how familiar are you with Marxism? Have you read all of it? And are you pretty good at it? Or? I've read more than the average, but I wouldn't say I'm an expert. Well, how much have you read? I, I couldn't, I don't know how to measure that. I mean, I've read a lot of the early mm -hmm. stuff. I've tried to read Capital. Capital is very challenging work. I've made it through, I've listened to commentaries. <laughs> But I, you know, I don't consider myself a Marxist. I'll be clear about that. Collected works are about 25 volumes. Yeah, no. How, no many, how many volumes would you say you've read? Oh, maybe one. I'll just maybe one, two, maybe two. I'm not. I'm not a Marxist. I'm not trying to be an expert in Marxism. So. All right, I've got a question. Uh, how does uh, democracy go along with your uh, Quakerness? Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, Quakers <laughs> operate by the. You know, the consensus of a meeting. Right. Which is fairly democratic, which means that even if one person says we don't agree with the decision, in theory, it doesn't always, it, one person can say we shouldn't, we should make, we, there isn't a sense of meeting, but Quakers do reserve the right to decide that the group is united even if a few individuals are, but it's rare, it, we never take a vote. Um, it's always, you know, does everyone present at this meeting agree with the decision? If you don't agree, are you willing to stand aside? That's how we work it, but I'm not arguing that that's a model for everyone. Um, I, you know, I participate in democratic organizations. I believe in letting majority rule when it's important, you know, that the majority, I think, is, you know, so anyway. Charlie? Yeah, Charlie. In Christian theology, the world is very hierarchical. There's God, angel, saints, man, woman, animals, and stuff. Uh, how in the world do you get a communal perspective out of that? Everything is hierarchical. Well, um, and well defined, and you know your place. And the happier, if the more you stay in your place, the happier you're going to be. You come along, and you come up with this, this leveling. Mm -hmm. That's not what the world is. There's no leveling at all. Tell the Pope there's a leveling. All right. So um, I, I, I know I accept that that is the picture that we get out of the ancient world. But I would also say that that view was not restricted to Christians. The, the Roman Empire had a hierarchical view of the universe. The, you know, the Hindu religion has a hierarchical view. All of these religions had hierarchical views. And I would say that that emerges out of the hierarchical societies of the time. And that the books written about the religions were written by people in elite positions. And so they reflected the hierarchy that they were in. However, if you look at the spirituality from the more, like, like the, the, the Jewish prophets were 
uh, writing in a period in which Judaism, the, the state of Israel was crushed and they were carried away into captivity. And their spirituality does not reflect that our hierarchical universe because they were at the bottom of it. And they didn't, you know, so they're not going to say, God is blessing this king who is dominating us. So they're, I, you know, I, I don't believe religion is inherently hierarchical. Um, I believe that that reflects a particular privileged position that people writing texts in the ancient world, and you can even find it in, you know, more modern that people think there's a hierarchical world. So, um, you know, I, I don't think that you can just, you know, that I think the hierarchical worldview is is a worldview that is restricted to, really, to hierarchical societies. All right, follow-up. This is rather intriguing. So, if the Judeo-Christian religions were invented today, mm -hmm. they'd be written, the books would be differently because society is different? Of course, It'd and they are. It'd be a totally different religion then, huh? Well, but I believe religion evolves over time. I don't believe it's stuck in the past. I, I mean, even though fundamentalism says, oh, it should be literally what is in the 66 books. It's got to go, got to evolve. I'll leave that <laughs> I will, I, you know, my definition of God won't fit you know anybody. That. So I'm, I'm very He's a unorthodox. Idiot, right? Very unorthodox on my view of God. Yes, Peter. And a previous answer. Uh, to a question about uh, abilities and needs, you said people really didn't need Rolls Royces. So then in a future, more enlightened society, as you might think of it, there will be no more manufacture of luxury goods like Rolls Royces? Well, we, we know from the environmental movement and from environmental science that the massive industrialization that makes Rolls Royces possible is destroying the the, the envelope of the atmosphere that we live in, it's destroying species and polluting our systems. We don't want that kind of a future that that's bringing us. So I think a rationally planned economy would not have luxury goods that damage the, the life, you know, damage the planet. So I'm not talking about an absolute leveling, but at least a more rational, ecologically and community-minded production. Okay, Charlotte Harrington. Um, the question I have is, you said that you were a universalist yes. um, as opposed to an atheist. What's the difference, as you see? Or is um, there a difference? Well, I, you can be an atheist and a universalist. Um, I've never been, even even since I don't believe in, the, in an orthodox God and probably don't believe in miracles necessarily, and, so I, I'm more of a naturalist. To me, the natural world that we experience through our five senses and through science that we learn about, that's the real world. And the stories about miracles and God is somewhat of our imaginary stories that have, they have a function. I mean, it's easier to tell a kid to behave if you say, God's watching you, because then he'll behave when you're not watching him. So it serves a function. But I also think that as adults, we sometimes need a little superego, as Freud would call it, telling us what right and wrong is because, you know, so I think God functions like superego. It's a, it's a way to keep your morality consistent, um, but I don't believe in a literal God. I, I believe in a, you know, a sense of, actually, the, if, I, if I had to believe, say, give a name to what I believe in, I believe in love. I believe in sharing and equality and try to, live that as consistently as any one imperfect human being can, which I can't, obviously, but... Uh, Bertie Connie. Uh, yes, if we accept the premise that the species is flawed, and there are those of us, maybe all of us, that have a some, if not a lot of greed, how would you address that? I'm sorry, I, did, I didn't quite catch the question. If we accept the premise that our species is flawed, right. and the greed is part of us, how would you deal with that? Um, well, I, I, I mean, we know examples of people who aren't greedy. So it's possible to be not greedy. Greedy is a relative thing. Um, I don't believe in Marx, you know, I, I, even on not a Marx, even Marx didn't say you're going to exterminate greed in the future socialist or communist order, but we're going to minimize the ability of it to inflict it on groups of people through a corporation. So, you know, I, yeah, people are flawed. And we, oh, and you know, there, there's the idea that working together, we can maybe mitigate our worst tendencies. 
not exterminate them, you know, because greed actually serves a function if you're the last survivor <laughs> on an island, you know, your you're, you're need to dig and find stuff, you know, so, so it, it just gets distorted in a society like ours that's based on competitive individualism. Yes, uh, Victor? Uh, I, I am getting out of my chest. <laughs> uh, you shouldn't have been born in the 60s, you should have lived in the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, you, 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 why do you think uh, there is no such thing as communism? I mean, they've never won, well, nobody achieved the state of the <laughs> You know, up to how close does anybody have come to? Being um, and and I, I, I was wondering, maybe, why why did uh, this uh, huge experiment, the Russian experiment, fail? Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, when when it reverted to free market enterprise, and all of the con well connected guys were just robbing the country blind. Mm -hmm. I say, unless they develop a middle class fair, <coughs> the next revolt, I hope they will send the uh, oligarchs to Miami instead of Siberia. <laughs> um, but uh, do you have any idea why it failed? Uh, well, well, I you mean, cannot was, rule. Yeah. You, you cannot. Uh, rule or, or make it in, uh, the human nature into law. Right. Well, there, I mean, there's a lot of study by people who are dedicated to either socialism, communism, or Marxism on what happened, why it did. What they see is a great start in 1917 with Lenin and the Bolshevik Party, and then it degenerated into Stalin and the purges and the, you know, the destruction on freedom of speech. And I think there was clearly a shift between Lenin and Stalin. But why did that happen? If we believe in historical determinism and the proletariat, and the fact is that Russia's working class is very small, and the working class, even today, the working classes in every country favor democracy more than the middle class. They want a leveling of political influence and power, and that's been borne out in political, I'm studying political science right now, I can point you to the studies where in countries where democracy is created, it was the working class aligning with a segment of the middle class against the ruling class, which is classical, almost classical Marxism, although Marx tended to minimize how important the bourgeoisie was, but they are actually important in the creation of a democratic society, which is why I am not a Trotskyist or a far left Maoist or whatever, because I think you do need an alliance between the working and the middle classes to, to get anything better than what we currently have. Uh, the problem in this country is that I think the 1%, the, the really rich, are taking off and leaving the rest of behind. Eventually, the middle class is going to have to turn to the working class to say, okay, we need to fight against this. It didn't happen in this election, but you know, hopefully in years to come, if not sooner, we can you know, figure out our American version of socialism, what that looks like. You know, we have a history to draw back of going back to Eugene Debs and beyond. Um, you know, and but yeah, it, the, Russia was an interesting case. A lot of people said, why did the first communist revolution happen in such a country that was so underdeveloped? And of course, Trotsky had his answers for that. But you know, I don't know. I, I, I think it was just the weird fluke of history. I mean, we could talk about more. That's so sure. The socio-economic injustice that uh, was in Russia, it, it, it was there for hundreds of years right. before it finally exploded. Mm -hmm. I, I think any society has that propensity to explode sooner or later, right. uh, as soon as, uh, as more and more socio-economic injustices accumulate, right. and, and it's bound to explode one whenever. In here, the thing that the reason it hasn't exploded is because we have a pretty sizable middle class, which is supporting the lower class and the upper class. The workhorse is the middle class. That's well, why so yeah. many democracies fail, is because even if you introduce democracy in a country that middle class is non-existent, yeah. you don't expect it to work. Right. Well, I mean, you see that in, in, in Egypt right now. I realize there wasn't quite a question in there, but 
in Egypt right now, the, the, the debate, the, the argument between you know the Muslim Brotherhood and the and Morsi, and then the, the, the left wing secularized elements of the Egyptian Revolution fighting. Wait a minute, you know, we want real democracy, not fake democracy, and it's going to be a struggle because their middle class and their working classes are in a different stage of development than any previous society we've seen. So that's uh, Margaret. Could you? Um, or, or would you be able to talk about the democratic socialism that's in the Scandinavian countries and the uh, lean towards socialism that's in, in uh, European countries with provision of services and stuff, and how that fits into what you're talking about? Uh, certainly, Europe has leaned more in the direction of this, and a part of that is because those are more monocultural societies. That's one answer, is that in Sweden you don't have a big, um, for example here we had a large African American slave population that was then emancipated and didn't fit in real well, so they were always able to be used as a wedge between the working class getting their demands. So Europe doesn't quite happen. And it's interesting that as Europe gets more African immigrants, they're now having, they're now facing pressure and. So you've got the EU trying to, at some level, disband social democracy. So it's, it's a complicated situation. Um, and, and as Marx said, again, I'm quoting him more than I probably would like, but um, you can't have socialism in one country, despite what the Russians and Stalin believed that you could. You have to have an international. And capitalism does not really exist in only one country. It can only exist when there's international trade that is organized a certain way. And the same thing I would say. The United States has been able to avoid social democracy because of the, the destruction of Europe in World War II and the economic boom in the U.S. in the 40s and 50s. So you know now that boom is dying. I mean, it's been dying since the 70s, but it's now really dying fast. And you've got the 1% taking off on their gold-plated gold jets, getting away from us, and you know, and exporting jobs. Of course, now they're re-importing. And why are they re-importing jobs? because of our technology. We have better technology. And technology is what is eventually going to make human labor redundant. And what happens then? How can you have a capitalism if you don't have workers to exploit? You know, it's a, I, I, anyway, that, I threw in a lot of things. But to Europe, um, you know, I think Europe is a great experiment after world, you know, the post-World War II uh, Europe and their attempt to use social democracy. But I also think it's got its limits. Um, but there are things we can learn from it in the U.S. Okay. How about the Scandinavian countries? Well, yeah, that was particularly Sweden is, is a, a, and Finland and Norway. They all have more egalitarian societies than we do. But uh, part of that is their cult, monocultural character. Uh, Andy. Andy. <laughs> The blurb, you know, that came out for you here, I mean, I do like the last phrase, and I don't know how this much it fits to you, but the idea of the left-wing version of the Tea Party. Right. I haven't seen how much that has fit into what you've said. Can you push on that more? Well, well, I mean, Occupy Wall Street at one level, I think, was the left-wing version. The problem is the Democratic Party didn't endorse it the way the Republican Party endorsed the Tea Party. And that's because the, the Democratic Party is funded by the same guys who are funding the Republican Party. So we're in a, I think we're in a transition between a sort of right populism that is conservative politically and the emergence of a left populism. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a new thing. It's just getting legs in our time. I mean, there are so many uneducated, or not high educated, unemployed people in this country more than ever before because you graduate with a college degree and then there's no jobs. And that was what Occupy Wall Street was a lot of white college kids with diplomas and no job. And that's why they kept going to the assemblies and everything. You know, us working people, I've been working, you know, I'm a working guy. Three time college dropout, I work 40 hours a week just like everybody else, chained to a desk, so to speak. Um, you know, and we couldn't go down to the, to the assembly every night of the week. But, you know, Wall Street and in Chicago, they could. And those, those folks, again, it's, it's not happening on the campuses. It's happening with the graduates. And that's to me, is an interesting shift. Mm -hmm. uh, Richard, uh, did you have? No, oh, all right. Uh, Bob Matter. OK, so you really think that uh, 
that the central planning method of determining production is superior to the price model that we use now, but where thousands or millions of decisions are made by in the market with prices and business people are, you know, they're right there on the cutting edge. They they know what models of things are selling, what or what people are like. You think that is inferior to having some apparatchiks sitting in Washington somewhere deciding how many blue shirts we should make, how many brown shirts we should make, and things like that? Maybe you missed it when I talked about local planning councils and you know that because there is some want to hear. <laughs> He's talking <laughs> That's okay. Maybe you missed it when I referred to participatory planning, participatory economic theory, which is argues not for central planning, but for bottom-up planning. That's what I believe in. I'm not sure if I understand that bottom-up planning. Um, you know, because you should be able to fire your boss. Why not? Why should you? Why should you? Why should I, as a working guy, and a bunch of my coworkers, we decide our boss is not doing his job? Why can't we fire him? Well, we can't. But we're a democratic society. Well, you're allowed to quit if you don't like it. You well, don't yeah, but then I'm out of a job. Why? Why not? Why shouldn't he get out of his job if he's not treating workers right? You know, it's, I believe in bottom-up planning, and and what it's going to work out in practice. I, you know, well, it's planning, like but what about planning for, for products, goods, and services, though? That's what Why couldn't me, as a working guy, have an input into how the product is planned? Exactly. Why has it got to be some dude with an MBA who decides how the product is planned? Or why to make, <laughs> in the first place? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You have consumers you're talking about. There's consumers out there, so you're making, so you're making you jeans or something. Mm -hmm. How are you going to decide what to put out on the marketplace, what people want to buy? And again, I believe in consumer councils as well, where consumers feed in their interests and we, we decide as a collect as a group democratically. Because we don't want to produce, again, I don't, we don't want to produce goods and commodities that destroy the planet. That that you know weaken our weaken our ability to provide a future for our own kids. So I think that's best done through democratic planning rather than profit planning. Because profit planning, whatever sells fast gets made, sure. even if it's bad stuff. So anyway, uh, I have a question myself. Oh, Richard, you do have a question. Well, <coughs> no, it developed after. <laughs> All right. No, I just wanted to say that to a large extent. Demand, particularly in this society, is managed. It's not. It's it's not spontaneous. I mean, that advertising is ultimately not about selling single products. It's about creating desire. And you know, billions and billions of dollars are spent creating that desire. So, you know, demand is not something that resides just with the people, the purchasers. Right. I mean, Noam Chomsky likes to make a lot out of the fact that the whole creation of the advertising industry was in, a, in the 20s and 30s was all about, well, we know how to make all this great stuff, but we don't know how to sell it. And so advertising came along to, to, to convince people they needed stuff <laughs> that they never exactly. needed before. Convince <laughs> people that they needed. Right. That's, that's the essence, right? Well, I, I remember that the... I'm calling on myself. So, uh, I remember that the, uh, I think it was the Austrian socialist uh, who uh, said that the socialist movement should be uh, based on uh, producer and consumer cooperatives, right. uh, the, uh, uh, of the party and the uh, labor organizations. Uh, free associations of workers. Um, what are, are producer consumer co-ops or, or uh, consumer co-ops that, that uh, might... Uh... Um, I haven't looked a lot. I mean, producer co-ops, I, I'm, I'm interested because I kind of wish I could work for one because I work for a, you know, a profit-driven corporation. Um, um, but I, there, I mean, you've got like Mondragon in Spain. That's the Mondragon. big cooperative that everybody talks to about. And says, so this is the economy of the future. Is the Mondragon, and and I I don't have it like at my fingertips of how that works. But it's definitely more democratic. There's an education component so that every worker, you know, is able to work in every job in a particular industry. So there's, you know, nobody's saddled to stuck in a dead end job for their whole lives. 
And you know, some people really push that as sort of the model of the future. And I think we need to experiment with something other than the profit-driven, market-driven capitalist model. Of course, to me, the, the big problem right now, uh, well, one of the sort of the overarching economic issue, uh, aside from climate change, which is very important, we heard a great presentation last week about climate change and how that is going to basically write our number. We can't for preserve this planet and not burn it up uh, with fossil fuels, you know. And so how do we end the fossil fuel industry? And, and so to me, there does have to be some sort of international coordination, and they're trying to do that in the Doha talks, but we know how those international talks end up being just about talk. But we do need to figure out how to sort of put an international break on certain industries. And, you know, it, you, you could call that top down, yeah, but, you know, in a crisis and an emergency, sometimes you have to do that, so. Yeah. All right, uh, Peter? So, uh, is China a communist country? <laughs> Short answer is no. <laughs> of course, they wouldn't say they were communist. No communist country says we operate a communist economy. They would have said they're socialist or collectivist. But because communism would only happen after the international, you know, appeal, the international spread of socialism, and then the abolition of well, all. Are there any real life examples of communism or incipient communism that you could point to as being a model or an inspiration? Well, I mean, all of these things are inspiration. Even. The Maoist Revolution. There are inspirational parts about it, and there are inspirational parts in the Russian Revolution of the Bolsheviks, and there's inspiration in the French Commune, you know, the Paris Commune. These are all inspirational, and they point the way to something bigger and better. But it, in the end, it is something of an international thing. It can't just happen in one country. Although I'm one of the people who believe that if we can pull something off in America that is goes beyond capitalism. That will make a big difference for the rest of the planet because we're the biggest economy right now, although China's moving up. But you know, Chinese communism is, is more, I don't know, it's, it's disheartening how capitalist Chinese communism is these days because they're, they're polluting and manufacturing with a vengeance. They're growing at, what, 8% a year? And I mean, we couldn't handle an 8% economy growth in this country because we don't have the institutions to handle it. So, maybe they do it. <laughs> yeah. um, yes, Tim. What would you see as the ultimate solution to capitalism? What would you see as the ultimate solution to, say, happen in the next few years? If you were, like, able to dictate it, for example. Oh, if I were able to dictate it, yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, well, we'd fire all those guys in Washington. <laughs> And then we put in working people <laughs> and say, all right, let's try to come up with something that isn't beholden to Wall Street. And, you know, I mean, it's a, that's a political answer to an economic question is, you know, it's, it's we, we need people who are in the interest of the majority, not in the interest of the minority. And that's what we got in Washington. We've got these rich fat cats who are giving money to each other to stay in office. And it, that's to me is one of the big ones, and of course the other one is you know labor unions. We labor unions are dying in this country. We need to bring them back. I mean the Chicago Teachers Union and my friend Charlotte back there that was on the was on the picket line this this year helping with the fight against uh, you know the Rahm Emanuel's privatization of public schools. I grew up in public schools. I got a great education from public schools. Don't take them away. Yeah. Don't charterize them, which is just just right. a joke. Um, anyway. So, yeah, <laughs> I rant. Sorry, I rant every now and then. Uh, is it Janice? Janice, yeah. Um, you started out saying it was the Jesus people. Right. The 70s who inspired you. Sort of, what's happening in Christianity today that is of this kind of movement? Is there anything? Okay, um, I, I have a great web reference, JesusRadicals.com. This is a group of anarchists who are Christians. Um, oh, <laughs> and these are, they're talking about kind of the stuff that was my bread and butter when I was a kid growing up dreaming of a better world was Christian anarchism would, would have been a great title for it. Now, I'm a socialist communist, I'm not anti-statist, so, 
I think they're a little naive about the idea of abolishing the state or a kind of creating the shell of the, the new society in the shell of the old, you know, the old anarchist um, saws, which, hey, eventually I think it will, as they mature in outlook, they'll have to think more realistically about the political situation. But the Jesus Radicals is a really interesting group. Um, on the Facebook, there is actually a group of Christian communists. I joined it. There's over 100 of them. In, in a few months. Uh, they actually got inspired by some of the stuff I was posting on Facebook and started this group. I'm not a Christian communist, technically. I'm a universalist communist, but the Christian communist groups kind of coalesced it. And so I really believe the younger generation, again, these people graduating with diplomas and no jobs, are going to start looking at radical ideas. And Christians are not immune to that. Um, I mean, the Christian right, I honestly believe, is dying in the younger generation. I don't believe the younger generation of evangelicals are buying into the conservative politics of the parents. Um, they may be keeping the religion, but they're changing their voter registration cards. So, um, you know, you've got the emerging church is another example of a progressive Christian evangelical phenomenon. And there are more. Wild Goose Festival is held every year, been held for about three years. Wild Goose Festival out in the, out in the east. Another Christian progressive event. Oh uh, yes, Charles. All right, Gerald. Now, religion has one accepting the world as it is and the status quo and accepting authority, and things will somehow there be another world where things that's where change, the only change that's going to occur. Now, communism is the dialectical materialism, the thrust of history where everything is in flux. I don't perceive how one can reconcile these two in any way, shape, or form. Okay, so I, th I see those as two really disconnected things, but I know what you're saying. Um, yes, Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, Evangelical Christianity is promise and afterlife, and there's a tradition within Christianity of transferring all of the prophecies of prosperity and happiness and health to another entirely ontologically separate death, post-death experience. However, if you go back and look at the Jewish prophets, particularly, and Jesus, I think, falls into this category, they were talking about changing this world, that God was going to intervene on this earth and set up a kingdom on this earth that was perfect and free of all this suffering. It's only with the influence of Greek mythology, Greek dualism, that this, this worldly transformation that, that goes back to the Hebrew prophets got transposed into a future far off planet we call heaven. Um, I, so I, I, don't, I believe that, yeah, that's the mindset of many Christians in our world today and historically, but I think in the earliest generations and in the texts of the ancient uh, the Hebrew prophets, it wasn't about another metaphysical distance place, but it was about changing the present world. There, There's a great line in... Oh, well, wait a minute. Some guy's going to show up and change the world. Mm -hmm. Is that realistic? Well, you want to change but that, that's a good question about what the Messiah you're referring to, the, maybe the Messiah. I mean, the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah are not clear it's an individual. They're more about it's, it's, a, it's actually the suffered servant psalms or servant prophecies can actually be talking about Israel as a suffering servant. So I think it was a more of a collective emancipation. I mean, yes, there was a messianic Davidic character, but that actually, you know, it, it, it's, it's ambiguous. I mean, we have, we have leaders. Well, I mean, you know, some people I think took Lenin as something of the Messiah, but, you know, so, so leaders are necessary. That's why I'm not an anarchist, but it isn't the leader's job alone. And I don't think this, the, the, old, the prophetic vision of, of the Hebrew prophets is just about a messianic savior. It's, it's about, you know, the force of history, which is God, because God created everything and history is under God's control in, in Hebrew spirituality. So nothing on earth is, a, is um, you know, if the world is going to transform into a paradise, which is really predicted in the Hebrew prophets, it's going to be, you know, this world, not heaven. I have a question. Uh, the, uh, Eugene Debs said, 
Yeah, if I could lead you into the promised land, I wouldn't because if I could lead you into it, somebody else could lead you out. <laughs> uh, yeah, he was the leader of the Socialist Party. And, right. uh, uh, the five times candidate uh, for right. president, but... Uh, but What's the question? Well, <laughs> but he was a leader, you were right. Right. Uh, all right, Bob. I didn't think okay. it was the so you guys want a flattening of the hierarchy? Now, yeah. Back a couple hundred years ago, when the Native Americans were ruling the roost here, there wasn't much difference between the way an Indian chief looked for his teepee mm -hmm. and an average Indian warrior or worker. Right. They looked pretty much the same. Right. Now, after we've had all this progress in capitalism and everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we have a few a few guys at the top have big mansions in Winnetka and Highland Park and everything, but the average guy is also a hell of a lot better off. We have indoor plumbing, we have big screen TVs, hot and cold running water, heat, because some people have cars. <laughs> and, and your question is? So, uh, aren't we still progressing and a lot right. better off now? Why would you want to go, you want to go back the way the Indians were? No. Um, how nobody I, had nothing. How I, everybody, how I, everybody had nothing instead of oh, some people had a lot. Well, I, again, if you, if, if, you, <laughs> if you study, I mean, if you're familiar with the Marxist theory of history, again, I, I don't consider myself a Marxist, but I'm, I quote him. He was the most in-depth on a lot of questions. And one of them was the idea of a historical evolution of society. The you know, the primitive communism, the slave society, the feudal society, the capitalist society, the socialist society, and then the communist society. He predicted a sequence of stages. Now, he eventually realized that it wasn't that neat and orderly, and it isn't that neat and orderly, because we didn't move from capitalism to socialism, although some of us, me, believe we can. Um, so we don't say that we go back to pre-capitalist times. We're saying that capitalism has built in problems it can't solve and we need something better the other side of capitalism. Okay. Did we run out of questions? Let's go to rebuttals, Bram. All right. We're, we're chomping at the we bit. Let's go to rebuttals. Okay. Uh, here. Let's line up. <laughs> Stick around, it's going to be good. Wisdom to impart or questions to raise. Uh, put up your hand here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Charlie probably wants to Oh, yes. Uh, seven, eight, nine. All right. Well, about, we've got about ten minutes. Don't exceed six minutes or we'll call you out, okay? Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I have been excommunicated by the church and by my own atheist uh, cohort. With all the ceremony and all that implied. Um, so something that struck me uh, wrong was when the speaker mentioned, what is he? Uh, speaker, uh, the uh, mic. Yeah. Uh, he said that uh, we are toward or uh, leading toward uh, human labor being redundant. And this, this bothers me. <clears throat> I think that is uh, utopic, it's uh, misplaced uh, uh, faith in technology. Uh, we have too much faith in all kinds of shit, and this is one more faith that it should be discarded as soon as possible. Um, the, the labor of humans uh, will always be necessary for, for many reasons that uh, you cannot, uh, we, we could not enter now into it, but we could. In, Future. Uh, the su survival of all, in great part, depending of the realization of some of the speaker ideas, we need to change the way we do in business. 
we need to change the way that we work, the way that we have input into the work that we do. Uh, we are forced to labor in slave conditions, making plastic shed that serve no other purpose than contaminate the seas in great amounts. We are dumping 4,500 tons of plastic shed in the sea every day. Now listen to that, every day, a billion tons every year. There are big islands of plastic shed in the seas that they are the size of Texas. There are hundreds of those islands around the world in different parts of gyros that the currents of the sea form. Uh, this plastic is changing not only the uh, chemistry of the sea, it's changing the fauna of the sea because interacting with ultraviolet rays from the sun, this plastic is releasing hormonal mimics that alter the evolution of the fish, of the eggs, and uh, the, the, the evolution of the animals in the sea. It's changing the temperature of the sea because when the, the plastic is in the surface of the, of the water, it interferes with the exchange of gases between the water and the air by, by uh, changing the way that the water behaves. Uh, uh, it's a tremendous disaster that we are creating by making all these things that we are making in slave situations, uh, destroying not only our humanity, but destroying the world we live in. I remember seeing, not long ago, but I say it many times, but not long ago, the last time, I saw that movie, The Forbidden Planet, that many of you must have seen. And uh, it shows you the evidence of civilization who went gun ho on developing technology to what end? To destroy each other. Because when, when they couldn't control it, they, they just get destroyed. And it seems like we are not able to control these corporations who are being bent into making more and more and more shit on different colors, but shit at all. Uh, it doesn't give us happiness, it doesn't need a connection with each other, and, and the destruction that this is all creating by us driving these stupid automobiles to go everywhere, uh, isolated from other human beings, uh, the television creating the consumption that, that, that it was described here very well. Uh, we, we have to change this, we have to. We have to find a way to, 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 to see the world different. And uh, uh, I don't know if somebody mentioned China today, but I, t I was talking with Chinese students today at the University of Chicago, and they didn't know that the man who was the whistleblower on the issue of the contaminated milk for babies was killed last week. After all these years, he was finally killed. He was hiding, and for some reason they found him and shot him in the face. And these Chinese students didn't know, and didn't remember. And it was a long time ago, it was not that long ago, but the corruption of this capitalist society now is so tremendous, it's so this devastating. Um, they uh, put a dam on the Jiangxi River, one of the major rivers in the world. As a consequence of that, they are destroying the fisheries because the sea, the, the water of the Jiangxi River doesn't reach the sea. So it doesn't bring the nutrients to the sea, so the fisheries are dying. Uh, it's destroying life on the course of the river because now the river doesn't flow naturally. So many species of insects, birds, frogs, amphibians, they die out because the whole thing is changed. Uh, the cultivation of the area has been changing and there's a tremendous rain in some areas and drought in others. Uh, so uh, what, what for? That was for because some corporations, some in the United States and, and in Germany, they were making a lot of money making the dump. 
and they produce 10% of the electricity that China consumes, they could, have, they could have saved that energy by changing the light bulbs, but they made this tremendous uh, boondog, <coughs> created earthquakes in the areas, I mean, a tremendous disaster. So we have to stop uh, doing this to the world, but we are not. And we continue mining uranium for stupid nuclear power plants and leaving all that shit for the people to eat contaminated fish and, 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 and radioactive water. Well, at least you can glow in the dark. Well, this to me was a real treat. Uh, I didn't expect too much. I almost didn't come tonight because I didn't like the title. Yeah. But uh, the speaker could easily drop in at my church and he'd, he'd be lost in the crowd. Uh, some of these same themes. Now, he didn't mention Unitarian Universalism. He mentioned Universalism. I didn't question him on that exactly. But it's interesting that the Universalists Unitarians and the Universalists got together in 1961, and the, um, they were close anyway. They were coming together, and they joined in 61. But the Universalists were the working class. Uh, the Unitarians were the uh, middle class type of people. Uh, he also mentioned Quakers. Uh, the Quaker community in, the, in, in Illinois is about 1,000 people. So he probably, I should have asked him, do you know this one? Do you know this one? Uh, there, he probably knows uh, half of them around. Uh, so uh, anyway, he's, he's kind of singing my song. He's, he's talking about things that, uh, you know, a lot of it I didn't know. I won't say I knew all everything he said, but uh, it certainly goes along with a lot of my... Uh, values and ideas. I'm trying to think, uh, the, the only thing he didn't quite say is community organizing, but he implied that in the, uh, in the Occupy uh, Wall Street uh, kind of thing. So anyway, I enjoyed myself tonight and I liked most of the things he said. There might be a few things I might quibble with, uh, but uh, it, it was certainly fun to listen. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Michael Foley. I'm glad I was here tonight. I did enjoy listening to the lecture. But I want to say something on a different topic. I said it here before. We are living through the end of the world. It's happening all around us. We're being prepared now for the next phase of eternal war. Our government announced back in about 2001, 2002, something like that. Our government announced the policy of eternal war. President Bush, the son, Cheney, Condoleezza Rice, Rumsfeld, a whole bunch of them. They had all their little cute sayings and the mantra. It's a generational thing. There's going to be mushroom clouds. We've got to have these words before. Otherwise, we're going to have mushroom clouds. It's going to be a long, hard slog and the old girl one. Oh, we got to fight them over here. Otherwise, we'll have to fight them over here. We're being prepared for the next phase of the war. It's been announced on the regular standard run-of-the-mill mainstream media reports. Syria is getting ready to use poison gas. Poison gas, poison gas, poison gas, that's the mantra. If somebody starts talking about poison gas, you know somebody in the United States is getting ready to start another war. And the absolute guaranteed we're going to war I heard it on the Sean Hannity show, at least on two different occasions. Rape. Don't forget, rape, 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 rape. Rape today, rape tomorrow, rape all over the place. Sean Hannity has announced that there are roving rape gangs in Egypt. Running around loose in Takir Square, raping women. When our government starts screaming about rape, 
The next thing they say is the soldiers are on their way. We got ships and airplanes loaded up with soldiers, ready to go and on their way. I don't know where they're going to. I don't know if the soldiers are going to fight a war in Syria or if the soldiers are going to fight a war in Egypt. Both of those countries are allies of the United States of America. We're giving a billion and a half dollars a year to Egypt to support and finance their roving rape gangs and we give money to Syria. Our government has told us for years we round up terrorists and send them off to Syria to be tortured because they can all get off. Those Syrian guys can get the good stuff out of the terrorists. We can't get the good stuff out of them because we can't torture them good like the Syrians can. Our government is an ally of Syria. We give them money. And our government is an ally of Egypt. We give them money. And we're hearing poison gas in Syria and rape, 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 rape in Egypt. It means, I figure, maybe next spring. Right now, they're giving us all the BS about, oh, the fiscal cliff and the debt ceiling and financial this, and we got to re-rig the tax code, cut government spending here and there. Then in January, it's going to be an inauguration. Then there'll be plenty of time to start screaming again about poison gas and rape. And long about March, that's when, that's when uh, the war in Iraq started, shocking off. President Bush, the son, gave Saddam Hussein the 24 hour, 48 hours to get out of town. And two days later, they started bombing Iraq. That happened in March. But it's been reported in the mainstream media, poison gas and rape. And those are the guaranteed words that they use to start war someplace. That's all. How many wars have begun because of poison gas? As much as I found the presentation interesting tonight, I do share a lot of the viewpoints of wanting to better our planet, better mankind, have the poor working man get better wages, and have prosperity for all. But to me, it's not going to be achieved through any socialistic revolution. It's not going to be achieved through any large communal deal. How is it going to be achieved? Yeah. Capitalism. It's called economic growth. Capitalism. Oh. It may, and Frank, for once, you're absolutely right. Yeah. It'll be capitalism, not the mercantilism we have today, which was decried himself by Adam Smith, where you have limited access to markets and you have a lot of monopolistic players in the game. If you really want to see how capitalism works, you just go to the consumer electronics market where we've seen innovation after innovation after innovation. Facebook is less than eight years old. The smartphone as we know it is probably less than four years old. Uh, and we see a lot of people in their lives benefiting a lot more ways by having these products available. Teenage, although they are misused. Teenage girls get to chit chat? Charlie, teenage girls are always going to chit chat. <laughs> whether they use a phone or whether they're doing it in person, face to face, or whether they do it electronically over a smartphone. The thing is, it's always going to happen, and you should be applauding the capitalist society for them able to recognize the market and create more jobs by making that product to market. That's how things work. And the thing is, you also have to understand that there is a valuable place for labor unions and progressives and a lot of other people who, who are decrying the very things that the Wall Street <laughs> one percenters are talking about. I hate fraud. I hate the malfeasance that's been going on at the top of these banks. I do believe a lot of our economic crisis was a, a, a result of fraudulent loans being taken out, these no-doc, no-ding loans, and uh, not looking in the true ability to be paid back. And I think that is the main reason why we had a corrupt system of giving easy money. Now it's collapsed. And like any other society, we go through a bankruptcy process and we prosper again. Over time, if you look at, for example, at the people of a company that we... De formerly decried, called Global Crossing. 
what they did was laid the fiber optic cable worldwide. They went bankrupt and the buyer of second remorse came in and revitalized it. Now we have worldwide communications where it's a lot cheaper to bring a phone call to India than here. You can even look at our airline industry. Yes, you know, you, it may, you may decry the, de, uh, the decline of air travel, but a hell of a lot more people are flying. You may decry a lot of the stuff about how easy it was to be with the monopolistic phone company, Ma Bell, but a lot more phone calls are being made today at a lot cheaper rates. And you have a lot more choice of how you communicate with people. And to me, the industri what's going to solve our climate change in this planet, and I've spoken on this before, it'll be a source of an exhaustible fuel. Yeah, more, I more do believe, Frank, that it's going to be in the thorium, li thorium liquid fluoride oh, reactor. On, yeah. And if you think I'm crazy, you can uh, you go are, talk to... Uh, speak. If you think I am, then I'll, I'll bring a few guys who will tend to disagree oh, with you on that topic. Yeah who are very much involved. I really think, and concerning you know, my own view of Christianity, tomorrow morning, I'll be at a place called Springbrook Community Church filming a service. And I do see a lot of sharing and a lot of helping going on between various people in there, but you also have to understand that that is a voluntary association. These people come to church, they believe the same thing, and they share their goods and their services and, and help out each other, but it's all done on a voluntary basis. There's no gun pointed to their head to do this. And it produces a lot of results. I have seen a lot of people's lives changed through this church that I attend. I've also seen a lot of people's lives just become better by adopting the Christian philosophy. And I also see, too, that the best thing we can do to bring our corporations to bear is you just simply stop buying from them and you buy from those that you support. <laughs> Nothing can be more democratic than your dollar being spent at that local business or at that Walmart. If you don't like Walmart, you don't go there. If you like your local business, you patronize them. I can think of nothing better democratic and as far as I'm concerned, you know, if you're in a job somewhere and you don't like the boss, you always have the ability to move on to something else. Now maybe you might be in a good position somewhere, maybe you might have good benefits, but at the same time you do have freedom of association. I'm sorry but I cannot subscribe to a philosophy that has been disproven time and time again of socialism. Now I do like sharing, I do hate corruption, but I think the big thing we need to realize is that we gotta speak against corruption speak against those who in high places will abuse power and it can be done. We've done it in the past through the progressive era. We had labor, you know, and that's what I have to say. There, I agree with our speaker, but I disagree with the methodology. Jim, they had a Pinkerton in the chat. Oh, sure. yeah. Yeah, I yeah, think it's in guy. And he shot you in the head. He killed you. He said, kill that guy. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is what I decided to talk on you know, after listening to the speech tonight. <coughs> and uh, I, I, I heard in, in the speech a word that I, I sort of latched on to. It was, and, and what I got here is a list of what I call bottom-up approaches uh, to decision-making. Uh, I, mean, I just have a list here I'm going to share with you. Uh, the first approach goes back to Jimmy Carter days. I don't know if you remember this. It was called zero-based budgeting. In other words, uh, at that time when Carter took over, uh, all the history was discarded and uh, Budgets were to be built from the bottom up, uh, based on current needs, not past history. You know, where you take the historical number and then you add five percent, that's your new uh, number. Instead, uh, zero-based budgeting is you, you, you start at the, the very uh, with no budget and you justify by uh, the new budget based on current headcounts. Uh, available dollars, uh, goals, and things like that. 
Uh, another uh, approach uh, that's used in business, I got this uh, from my uh, management class and organization, uh, is something called the collegial management style. Uh, this is a, as opposed to an autocratic manager that makes all the decisions for himself and just tells the workers uh, to go out and fill the orders and ship the products and things like that. The collegial approach is sort of like our little table in the back there where they all uh, discuss among themselves uh, you know, how uh, they're going to accomplish uh, meeting next year's goals and you know, the products they want to uh, focus on and which ones didn't work and which ones uh, should be tried or any new products or whatever. And, you know, it goes all the way through, uh, uh, you know, sales is always a driver in any uh, budget scenario. Uh, there's another approach, uh, we call it the uh, shared decision making. I unfortunately don't have a concrete example of that to throw, uh, share with you, but uh, I've heard that word term used. Uh, the other thing, uh, we, we threw out a word for marketing strategy. And there's two parts of a marketing strategy, whether you realize it or not. There's a push part and a pull part. Advertising is considered to be the pull part, uh, where you get on the TV or the radio and you advertise what you're trying to do. And then you have the pull part, which is all of you are familiar with, is the sales discounting and the magazines that come out, and like McDonald's has a thing going now where you're, uh, you can go for the Big Mac or uh, uh, the uh, breakfast sandwich, the Egg McMuffin, and you get a two for one. Uh, right now, uh, Burger King, uh, this weekend, I guess it ends tomorrow, uh, they're offering, uh, they're celebrating their 55th anniversary of the Whopper, so if you go and buy one Whopper, you get a second one for 55 cents. And uh, I just heard on uh, uh, radio the other day that uh, uh, Arby's is offering, if you can find an Arby's, uh, they're offering uh, uh, um, the uh, Reuben uh, sandwich, uh, two for uh, six dollars. The other, the other thing that uh, drives, uh, you know, uh, decision making and a bottoms up approach is public hearings and surveys. Uh, we just had one with the CTA, a couple of buses were earmarked to be shut down the, the uh, Lincoln Avenue bus, and there was one up in Evanston where I lived that was going to be discontinued. I was surprised as heck uh, to see that the uh, Lincoln bus is still running uh, between uh, Fullerton and uh, Lawrence, and also uh, this evening bus that uh, is up in Evanston is still running overnight. It's a, night, a midnight bus from uh, through Evanston to the Red Line. Um, and also, you know, the surveys that are popular among the politicians and strategizing, you know, trying to find out, you know, how their candidate is doing with the populace, you know, is he hitting in the right areas. Uh, David, David Axelrod is great at that. Uh, he's a well-known uh, Chicago fella in uh, campaign strategy. Uh, we have this thing about charter schools that, you know, someone sort of debunked uh, charter schools, but oddly, uh, they're actually viewed as something uh, valuable. In fact, there was a, I think down at the Soldier Field today, they had a, a meeting, uh, all the schools were there, and uh, you were allowed to uh, interview with the schools, but uh, from what I understand is that, you know, there's such a demand for those high quality charter school education that there's a waiting list, you know, because they're perceived to have uh, a, a value that gives a, a child a good education. Um, the other thing we have is test marketing. Uh, I remember the, some time ago, uh, uh, I think it was Bird's Eye. <laughs> Bird's Eye had a, a market test, you know, for did you like more cheese or more flour? It's, and uh, so that's one way of getting in, input into you know, a uh, bottoms-up approach uh, into what goes into a product. Okay, thank you. The latest report on the charter schools today say that the charter schools 
under the CPA's own standards fail. Yep. And I'll you come and there. say how great they are. How could you, you come out and be speech? allowed to say such Look. a shit in there? <laughs> God damn it. No, it's not my opinion. It's what the CPS reported today, man. What the fuck? Well, yeah, I, well, show me the article. We don't yeah, always abide yeah. by our, our rules, <laughs> you might have noticed. Uh, anyhow, uh, I identify a whole lot with uh, the talk. I, I was a student for the ministry, uh, and uh, I have, you know, in my own church, uh, United Methodist Church, I, I mentioned uh, United Church of Rogers Park, uh, we, we say every member a minister, uh, but, uh, you know, we, uh, Jesus was interested in people caring. He was interested in people being children of God, that means following in the family uh, tradition of working uh, out God's love. Uh, God cares. Life is caring. God is life. God is love. It says so in the Bible. The epistle of James. All right. Yeah, you should read that epistle of James. Yeah, I will tomorrow. Yeah. Well. Uh, and I've been uh, a member of the, well, no, I was a tender, uh, uh, a tender at uh, 15th Street Friends Meeting in New York for oh, about uh, four years. Uh, I was a conscientious objector. That's uh, when I became a Christian. No, I've been brought up in Christian science. Uh, which uh, taught that uh, sin, disease, and death were not real because God didn't make things bad. <laughs> and God made everything and saw that it was good. And that's true. That God has a purpose and a meaning for everything in this universe. And every one of us. There's life is like that. Life uses whatever it can find to, to live, to expand life, to enjoy life, to... And when you see Jesus, Jesus explained and exposed what it was to really live and die. In his dying, he gave life. In his dying, he was life. And God is love. God is life. You say, oh, who's going to prove the existence of God? Who proves the existence of love? You see the evidence of it when you love. When you care. When you give of yourself, when you, when you, uh, well, maybe become a socialist. <laughs> you know, maybe step out from uh, the limits that you have and try to expand the freedom of, of humanity, of, of any person you know who's in trouble, need, sorrow, sickness, dying, whatever. God is a whole lot bigger than our conceptions of God. But God is real and gives what meaning there is to anything, any ideas we might have. God is not just a myth, uh, a Santa Claus. 
that Santa Claus is a myth, but it's based on a, a bishop in, in Asia Minor who made it possible for young married couples to get married, uh, young couples to get married, because it was expensive. It was a big thing to get married. <laughs> To be a family, uh, they had to save for for years uh, to, to throw a wedding and have a feast and, and acknowledge that there was a, a marriage between uh, this young couple and. Oh, God save us from our, the, the, the sins uh, of our churches and our, uh, our Christians, uh, 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 whomever else. Uh, but, uh, yes, and I'm also a former secretary of the I'm Socialist Party of the USA. <laughs> I just don't know how to approach tonight's topic here. Anyhow, thank you very much, Mr. for your initial effort here. Um, and if I encounter anyone who's thinking about getting married, I'll recommend they go see Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the bizarre thing. <laughs> I'm going to be eclectic as usual here. Um, you know, theology uh, is is basically, and I, I'll I'll leave it at Judeo-Christian is is hierarchical to cosmology, as I said a couple times, and it's if anything, it's static. Um, in Christianity, they really never even came up with the calendar. I have a speech on that one time. Because year one year was the next. The only thing that was going to happen was the 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 second coming, or the end of the world, and there was no concept even of, of development whatsoever. The universe. That's that's what I mean. There were there were some uh, like in the age of discovery, of course. Uh, there were certain things because they had difficulty then. Uh, God created the world and there was a whole plan and it's outlined in scriptures and so forth. And to, and you know, but then when they began with contradictory things, uh, certain, certainly in astronomy they, they had some difficulty reconciling this. Because the world in fact was fixed, finished, <laughs> operated in this fashion and it was all spelled out in scriptures. Um, by the way, I wouldn't. I don't know much about the prophets, um, you know. But and even I always think about this. The culmination of Christianity is Revelations. I like to think of it, and those are just strange documents and bizarre things. I don't know if we can give any reckoning to that. But the problem is, is that you come along with other social, other other interpretations of the world, and instead of this top-down type of Judeo-Christian one, you had some people who came along and said, perhaps there's another model, perhaps it's circular. Or perhaps there is, in fact, change. Perhaps it's a teleological. Perhaps there's a point A to point B. Actually, the circular one is more popular today. Nevertheless, the socialists and communists said, no, there's, there's history. History is headed in some directions, all kinds of things. And, 19th century, uh, Darwinianism, evolution, and things like that. Very popular. Um, and this contra this is strictly, this is contradiction to the established world established in, 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 in scriptures. Um, now, one of the things you hit on there was that another, the one people who come along and like this fixed world and so forth, are in fact these capitalists. Um, they don't, they are entrenched in their hierarchy. And for whatever reasons, the they one. are either fearful 
are, are not inclined to be receptive to change. <laughs> and that's their modus operandi, that's why they get weaponry and things of this nature. You have to, you have to be cautious because there are people who won't recognize authority and they're dangerous. They're dangerous to your life, that's where you have to get weaponry. Um, yeah, the socialists are the dynamic. Now what Bob is totally, and Tim too, is they got some notion that socialist societies are like static and don't do anything and nothing happens. Historically, that's nonsensical. The Soviet Union came out of the revolution and in 50 years, became a major industrial power. At what cost? Because it was not the started. cost. The cost was they went through World War II. Before the United States even got into World War II, nine million Russians had been killed. This country was level. And they came along and they're suddenly, how are they exploring space? They are providing for the people. They came from nothing. Literally nothing. This is peasantry and things of that nature. The corporation and they and they didn't it. do it without one bit of capitalism. It can in fact be done. And it's nonsensical. And to say that Slave labor and, the, the and to say labor that camps. capitalism and businesses are successful <laughs> is nonsensical. I don't think there's what is the failure rate of business? It's almost like eighty percent. You know, I mean, and you're talking about, oh, they do surveys and, you know, they, they, they try to gather data and they still fail and succeed. Failure, it's just fraught with it. And you, 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 I don't understand this. You talk about a symbol of the success of the capitalism is that we can produce gadgets. Gadgets is what Plastic we're producing. Yes. Plastic gadgets for teenage girls to chit chat. <laughs> this is the achievement of this system here. Our gadgets for adolescent girls <laughs> to have fulfilling lives. <laughs> we don't need that at all. No. You need roads, you need power. I mean, need and to say that, oh, a state economy, we can't. We can't have this. I mean, I don't know. You know, we're going to talk about that materialism a little bit coming up here later in another program and things like that. <laughs> I guess, you know, what, what is the system? You want a system that brings, no, the greatest goods and the greatest number? I don't know if that's really the defining characteristic of civilization. I was also thinking there that, like, there's no discovery, Bob. What, there's no discovery? Without capitalism, I was saying, what about the guy that discovered fire? <laughs> I mean, he, he didn't make any money, you know? <laughs> Anyhow, thanks a lot. Let me know when you got another one in you. All right, take care. Okay, well, thanks, Charlie, for, uh, for your uh, presentation tonight. Um, I think you are confused, as is really most other critics of capitalism are uh, on the left in its entirety. Uh, you're confusing capitalism with privilege. Oh. <laughs> and uh, so I, I really try, I, uh, hope you uh, read uh, The Menace of Privilege by Henry George Jr. and come to our book club discussion about it in January. Maybe you'll see things somewhat differently. Uh, the abuses that we see manifested uh, usually in capitalist systems though, are, are because of privilege. And that privilege is, privilege is, is appropriating wealth, not producing wealth. So privilege would be a, uh, a franchise on something. You know, you're granted a temporary monopoly of some kind. Uh, or maybe even a permanent monopoly. Or you have a favorable uh, you know, tax benefits just to you or your industry, protective tariffs uh, that help you and, you know, and, and uh, harm consumers. Those are, those are privilege type things. Of course, the granddaddy of all privilege is land ownership. Okay? And 
So this is what, uh, if you read Adam Smith, uh, The Wealth of Nations, and I think this went over a lot of people's head because there was so much good stuff in The Wealth of Nations, it was hard to pick some of these things out and think about them. You know, there were so many good things, so many profound things. But the, in the conclusion of chapter one, Adam Smith basically says, all benefits of a society accrue to the landowners. Well, then Henry George grabbed this idea and then studied this further and wrote about 10 books about it and looked at it from every angle. And, and what I've, I've read them all and looked at it from every angle too, and it's bulletproof. Uh, you, know, you know, why has poverty persisted uh, all through all these major, you know, industrial revolutions and everything, and product, all the productivity. Why, why is poverty persisted? Well, it's because the rent always goes up. You're always, you know, you're, that's why, why are we work? we're still working 40 hours a week like, you know, people were 30, 40, 50 years ago. And you think by now we'd be on a lower work week and everything else. No, we're not. Why? Because all, 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 all excess productivity or all, all, all excess production goes to the landowner. Again, this, and this is the law of rent. And uh, uh, if you read Ricardo or if you come to the Henry George School and take some classes there, you can learn about you know, the law of rent, exactly how that works. The law of rent. Yes. Uh, so that is, a, you know, in a nutshell. Um, now, any of the socialism, communism, fascism, if any of those isms except capitalism, they are all totalitarian. And they all end up going in the totalitarian direction, as von, uh, Frederick uh, von Hayek pointed out in The Road to Serfdom. Yes. Because you're taking the decisions away from the people and putting them in the hands of somebody else, some, some planner somewhere, some decision maker. Uh, and no, no, capitalism is perfect because every, every, every vote, every, every purchase, every dollar is a vote. Yep. And, you know, you're rewarding the winners and punishing the losers, and it's very severe. Now, yes, Charlie, Cap, businesses do go out of business. Yes, as a matter of fact, I learned at Purdue in economic theory that, uh, uh, you know, under a competitive market, all profits go to zero. You know, that's, that's what happens under perfect competition. All profits will go to zero. So, yeah, businesses go out of business sometimes, and, uh, but that's fine. Other businesses come along. Uh, and look, there's the buggy whip business is out of business, and the you know women's corset companies are out of business. I mean, all kinds of it's actually making things. a comeback. Yeah. What's that? It's actually making a comeback. Yeah. Corsets are? Yeah. 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 That's a big thing. What happens thing. to all the employees? What do they? Well, they find other they find other jobs. Does anybody care? They find other they find other jobs, and the, and the business it's overall proof. Matter of fact, if you read the uh, uh, the economic essays by Bastiat. You know, he talks about a guy, an employer who comes up with a new uh, method, new contraption of some kind to, uh, to, to do work with, and he lays off a worker. And, uh, you know, everybody like Charlie is like, oh, God, this, poor, this guy's out of work. This is terrible. This modernization. This guy's out of work. Well, what happens is that guy will find another job, but meanwhile, this guy, the, Purdue, the business owner, will now be able to lower his prices and be more competitive, you know, and undersell his competition because he came up with this new method or machinery or whatever. And so what happens is the consumer now can buy these products cheaper. So mankind has, has benefits. Mankind is what benefits because we're getting more production with, with less input. And by the way, Frank, you're wrong to be uh, criticizing technology. Technology's helping save the environment. For instance, I give you the internet. We no longer have to chop down trees and transport them and cut them and grind them and turn them into paper and then print them. Then have some goddamn team serve, which is a union <laughs> it, I'm a uh, you know, <laughs> driving a goddamn truck delivering these things. Uh, you know, which is a, a privilege because it's they have a monopoly on labor uh, with with their customer, you know, so they're getting higher than market wages, in other words, so that's a privilege, but what we have to do, which is another reason, just like school teachers. But anyway, um, so anyway, Frank, so all that now is being replaced by these people with, with, you know, with computers, with, with the internet, online publishing. Look at all that pollution and everything that we've saved. The latest report says 
that the trees are disappearing 10 times faster than they did in the last 100 years. But so that is bullshit. It's not, but it's the not because of publishing. It's accelerating, destroying uh, the earth. If it is, it's not because so of publishing. Me, the internet, because computers have helped that. Bullshit. And there's all kinds of other instances where that, where computers and technology are help helping uh, helping us live more environmentally uh, respectful. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and by the way, for all you public school teachers out there, I give you one Teddy Roosevelt, two-term president of the United States, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, winner of the Congressional Medal of Honor, former New York Police Commissioner, he did win the Medal of Honor uh, post posthumously, uh, homeschooled. Oh. <laughs> all right. Uh, locking the camera. Since the subject of Theodore Roosevelt, about whom I have been lately reading a three-volume biography, came up. <laughs> yes, it's funny you should bring up that name. Yes, by Edmund Morris. Theodore Roosevelt was not shy about denouncing certain capitalist business people in his time and calling them malefactors of great wealth. That was privileged people. That was privileged. And in addition, his cousin, the other member of the Roosevelt family who became president, referred to them as economic royalists. And both presidents did not hesitate to let these people have it. Uh, first of all, now I can't help it if the Hoosier in the room uh, chooses to want to live in an era in which Benjamin Harrison was still president of the United States. <laughs> And when people still actually enjoyed the poetry of James Whitcomb Riley. But those of us who prefer to live in more modern times tend to take different views. I don't agree that capitalism is perfect. I agree that it's better than some other systems have been tried, that have been tried, but at that it needs to be carefully watched and regulated. And as for your friend Henry George, I'm not going to get into the argument of, of whether his single tax theory was right or wrong. I would simply point out that he himself was a Christian socialist, and that his mere entry into the race for mayor of New York at the end of the 19th century, that was enough to switch a number of votes from Teddy Roosevelt, who was the Republican candidate for mayor, to the Democratic candidate, Abram Hewitt, to make sure that Mr. George didn't get into the mayor's chair. He's a Tammany Hall candidate. Period. End of story. Now, I would say this, however, for capitalism. The subject of the Soviet Union just came up a while ago, and Tim rightly pointed out at what cost did they make progress. The answer is at great cost. Yes, Stalin got Soviet industry advanced by many decades, but he did it at the cost of God only knows how many lives. Uh, that hundreds of people got massacred. He used enormous amounts of slave labor. And I'm sorry, I would not want to see Stalinism introduced here to the United States. And one of the great contributions that Franklin Roosevelt made was to make sure that the United States didn't turn to either communism or fascism. Thank you. Throughout human history, there has been a society that is practiced from each according to his deed, to each according to his, from each according to his ability, to each according to his needs. This is a hunter-gatherer society, which is about a, generally a group of about 25 or so, live together all their lives, or they know each other very intimately. Of course, there isn't much showing all that that the uh, hunter-gatherers can give each other. They don't have any production to speak of. They don't even have agriculture. But uh, there's something I've spoken about at the college all oh, some years ago. I can't remember when. Apparently you've all forgotten if you've heard it. But anyway, uh, The human, psycho, human emotional and psychological makeup developed in hunter-gatherer groups. They grew, developed aggressive emotions to 
uh, sympathetic emotions to impel each other to come to each other's aid, and aggressive emotions to deal with cheaters. And without going into all the faller all about that, they eventually evolved a medium of exchange which kind of made their uh, from each according to each, he needed all this stuff, uh, a bit obsolete. Uh, it's a very personal society, but it's a very limited society. I just like to spend your life with 25 people all your, all your life. Instead of sharing meat, they sold it? Well, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll, I'll speak about it sometime. I'll see if I can remember the talk I gave several years ago. But anyway, as far as the uh, Soviet Union not causing any uh, damage or anything, there was a series of books that came out about 40 years ago by one Antony, A-N-T-U-N-Y, something about how just about every major, just about how every major advance in the Soviet Union came from Western sources. There was a fourth series, supposed to have enough, uh, another a series, another something in this series. And the State Department refused to give him the, the files that he'd been using to, to write this book. He also wrote books about Wall Street and Hitler, and Wall Street and for FDR, and Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution. Yeah. It's been years since I've read those books, but you kind of reminded me of it tonight. And uh, well, what else was I thinking of? Uh, Uh, well, I'll have to say that for next week. I, uh, I forgot to, I should have announced this afternoon that the Michigan State Legislature passed a right to work law. Oh, oh. <laughs> Yay. And we've got this uh, fiscal cliff coming up, and all of a sudden, payroll taxes are going to go up a job, uh, taking, uh, they're going to take a, a jog upwards, which means that they're going to do, well, they already do the sales taxes, but tariffs do the imports. To unions that I had to never complain about that I know of. And it's just going to be doing it more. So maybe we will clarify a few things at long last about some of these relationships between prices and labor. Uh, I think maybe I think maybe what I what I kind of figure is that maybe we just have a longing, some deep longing, for a more personal universe, and all this impersonal market stuff just kind of rubs us the wrong way. Even though you have to do it. about capitalism. I won't be long, but for me, business is relationships. You do not have a successful supplier or a successful um, deal without some form of trust. And uh, for me, what represents trust more between two parties and what this stuff represents? Trust. It means that you can, uh, if you come up I'm with it. I'm looking for me for bounces. No, I understand. 
But the point of the matter is, in capitalism, and a lot between markets, you know, people naturally will do that, even if they're in a village, two villages coming in, if they're not fighting, they're trading. And trade has gone back many, many, many years. If you get a good deal, you're good. Nobody likes it cheap. If things are done any up and up, I think it's a good way of going. I'm not saying our present system is perfect, but I can say it's better than all the rest. What's your relationship with the unemployed? First of all, I would like to say something that I didn't say when I was up here before. I would like to thank our speaker for an excellent right. presentation. Right. And he certainly made, I don't pretend to agree with everything that he said, but he certainly gave Paul some interesting questions <laughs> and uh, gave, us some, gave us some interesting things to think about. I will close by saying that my own mother was an active member of the Chicago Teachers Union and was an active public school teacher at McCutcheon Elementary School in Uptown. And she worked hard to educate the second graders. And I don't regard the career of public school teacher as a privilege. I regard it as a career of a lot of hard work which my mother put in. And if, you, and if the Hoosier in the room ever says anything about the Teamsters Union again, well, I happen to be a proud member of the Teamsters, and they helped save my, my job before I retire when I worked for Cook County. And if he ever says anything about it again, some guy named Rocco will show up at his door. <laughs> finally, finally, the last thing I would say is, Many years ago, there was a conference that was held in Moscow. And at the close of this seminar on, the, on some new economic policy or other, somebody said, Comrade Chairman, what is the difference between communism and capitalism? And the chairman said, Comrade, that is a very good question, a very important question. I'm glad that you asked it. Under capitalism, man exploits man. And their communism is the other way around. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they're going to break. Time to rebut. You're the best. Sorry. That was oh. kind of what? Well, I had to be a Or somebody who wasn't very friendly. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Whoops. That's a problem. Very good. What the only thing you have to do is change the direction, change the position of this place. Charlie, you get the last word. Okay. Speaker yes. gets the last word. Charlie? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's All right. Um, I obviously can't respond to every single rebuttal, right. but uh, thanks everyone for your thoughts and for um, uh, expressions of appreciation. And here's my gadget. Um, and I agree there are, there are too many gadgets. But, um, and I believe technology goes both ways. It, it can decrease our dependence on certain kinds of extractive production that is unhealthy and it, as well as encourage negative kinds. So I think the, uh, and, and so, you know, to me, an ecological uh, awareness has to pervade our politics or we're in for really deep shit, uh, including the big, toxic islands of crap plastic in the ocean. And I've seen it. The pictures are hor horrific if you see these things. Um, you know, I, I kind of think I said pretty much what I what I want to say and everybody, you know, I've heard that, oh, capitalism is fine and, you know, it'll, it'll work itself out, the blind hand of the market and so on. Um, I, I just, you know, I didn't live in that world. That was the 40s and the 50s, you know? Uh, the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s have been hard on working people. Um, and, and the rest of the world is not profiting for this. I mean, Africa is still the most poor continent on the planet, and Asia and Latin America are not far behind, although they're, they're picking up, and of course, now we have the Arab Spring. Um, I mean, I, I can't, you know, there's a point at which I, I guess I don't think I can convince everybody that mm -hmm a post-capitalist, socialist, communist future is going to be better, but 
I see disaster down the road if we don't change the directions that we're going. Um, and of course, the reason I titled this Jesus Made Me a Communist is in part because of the Christian right. The Christian right has been very influential in this country in turning us away from the, um, you know, the, the policies that we had, where we had robust policies supporting working people in the 40s and 50s and 60s, and those were eroded and taken apart by the 80s and 90s by Mr. Bill Clinton, you know. So it's not, the Republicans didn't do it all. <laughs> you, know, uh, I, you know, it turns back to it's the 1% and their ability to control who's in office and what, what laws get passed. Yeah. So I, my hope is rest with working people coming together and creating, fighting their own interests rather than, you know, just deciding, you know, blindly behind the uh, Democratic Party or the Republican Party for that matter. Um, and again, as I say, I'm a member of the Chicago Socialist Party, which is kind of very small. We have about a couple dozen paper members in the city of Chicago. We need more. We'd like to run some candidates and get the idea of socialism for the 21st century, not Stalinism, not Marxism, not even Leninism, although those all are important traditions to examine and study. In the end, we have to make a new way. And um, thank you for putting up with me. And uh, I don't know if I got another one in me. Uh, as I said, I'm planning to write a book on this. Um, and uh, so that means there's a lot of stuff I didn't say, but I won't try to say it all in this last minute here. So uh, everybody, thank you, and good night. For me. I'm a preacher's kid. It's in the book. Yeah. Second, <laughs> second, <laughs> second. Good job. 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 Good job